Well, Carbon Tracker is a not-for-profit financial think tank based in London. And our goal is to try and align global capital markets with the climate goals set out, particularly in the Paris Agreement, which is to keep the world within two degrees of warming. Well, at the moment, uh, it's not illegal to be a coal company or an oil company or a gas company. They provide energy. The challenge we've got is that to keep global warming below uh, 2 degrees or even 1.5 degrees above the global average mean temperature of around 16 degrees, we have to limit the use of fossil fuels. And that limit, um, to keep us below 2 degrees, is, can be expressed in what we call a carbon budget. So scientists tell us that we cannot emit more than around 900 gigatons of CO2 before we exceed the threshold. And that's caused by you know, the known effects, the physical effects of, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now, when you look at um, co corporates and governments, uh, they're all running around trying to develop new, new, new reserves of gas or oil or dig out the coal. Uh, but when you add up those reserves, you can look at the carbon content of those reserves. Uh, and if all of it gets burned, the world's going to release 2,000 gigatons, 2,500 gigatons of CO2. So that tells you half to three quarters of known fossil fuels will have to stay in the ground. Now, why markets are not getting this right is markets don't understand these physical limits. There's no one telling the markets, oh, look, Exxon has got to stop developing new projects or Chevron should start to begin a, an orderly wind down. There's nobody telling the markets, actually, this has to st stay in the ground. So that tells us that markets are pricing the risks wrong. They're not understanding physical limits. They're not really understanding the science. So what Carbon Tracker did is we we developed a thesis, which we call unburnable carbon or stranded assets, that said, look, if the markets don't get this one right, they could be deploying billions, no trillions of dollars, if you look at our research, into projects that are just not needed in a two degrees world. So what we try and do is educate Wall Street analysts and City of London analysts about the risks and what does it really mean to implement a clean energy transition. So, so actually right now, in 2017, we've got about 20 to 30 years to start to wind down the use of fossil fuels before emissions take us above this one and a half degrees, two degrees threshold. Um, so what that means is that companies have to stop going exploring for new oil and stop digging for new coal. Particularly, we need no more new coal, no more coal-fired power stations. Um, so. Um, what we hope Wall Street analysts will do is start to figure out um, what does this mean for Chevrons and the Exxons and the Shells and the BPs if they can't go ahead and develop any new more projects. And that's where the financial risks come in and that's where the alignment of climate goals uh, is with financial goals. Because if a company, for example, spends $10 billion on building a new pipeline from Canada to the US because they think it's got a 50-year life, what happens if it only turns out to have a 10-year life? Uh, the economics, the return on capital are going to be all wrong. So they're the risks we're trying to highlight to get the maths around unburnable carbon into the metrics used by your typical Wall Street energy analysts. Well, Lazard, Lazard published some research a short while ago that said that in the last seven years, the price of photovoltaics has dropped by 85%. We've got to the stage now where solar is, is beating coal um, and other fossil fuel energy sources out of the park, just purely on cost and efficiency. And if you look at demand for, for petroleum, a lot of the large oil companies are saying, well, you know, electric vehicles will only have a 5% penetration rate in, in 20 to 30 years time. Now, what history tells us around transitions um, is that it can happen much faster than people think. So um, there was an old uh, video company called Blockbuster, you probably remember it, it was listed on the stock market. Um, what, were the sh what were the company telling their shareholders when um, streaming off the web came in? Were well, they saying, oh, don't worry, people will still be using videos in 20 years' time? They weren't. They realized actually the game was up, and in came Netflix and, and live streaming, and the same with music, with Spotify and and YouTube, it kind of saw off the use of, of uh, the physical record player. 
Um, and the same thing is going to happen with electric cars. In our view, what will happen is they're not just going to get a 5% market share. When the cost of an electric vehicle gets down to the same rate of, of the internal combustion engine, which we think is just, just a short few years off, then why would anyone want to use the internal combustion engine again? They'll go straight to electric vehicles. And it's a bit like the same, you remember Blackberries? Just a few years ago, they had a like 30, 40, 50% market share in handheld devices for, for emailing and, and so on. And then in came Samsung and in came the Apple iPhone. They didn't get a 5% market share after five years. They got a 50% market share. So we think the same thing will happen around electric vehicles, around the adoption of uh, clean energy sources around the world. And if you're in Africa and you're not connected to the grid, are we really saying that they're going to build coal-fired power stations in the middle of the savannas of Africa with huge pylons for hundreds of miles transporting coal-fired power generation. No, what's actually happening right now is at the village level they're building uh, mini-grids uh, built on solar or household level solar and they're skipping um, completely um, uh, coal-fired power stations and going straight to the renewable energy source. And we saw an example of that in Africa and Asia with the telephone. They, the people didn't go from having no phone to having a phone with a wire through the streets to then going to a handheld device where, you know, an iPhone, a mobile. They went straight from having nothing to straight to mobile. And we think in those parts of the world, the same thing is going to happen with clean energy. They're going to skip having no energy and going straight to having clean energy whether it's uh, solar or wind or small-scale hydro. Well, the economics of the oil and gas industry has changed fundamentally in the last 10 years. It's become very, very expensive to go up into the Arctic and to alter deep water to find uh, new oil. So the days of, of putting a pipe in the ground and, uh, and digging up oil really cheaply at $10 a barrel is gone. All those cheap barrels of oil have been sold and have gone in, in many cases. And to replace your, those old reserves um, sold with new projects, you're having to go into very, very difficult parts of the world. And what the data tells us, if we look at the break-even prices of oil projects, is that for many companies, many big listed companies, it's costing them above $55 a barrel to get the oil out of the ground. What's the price of oil right now? It's around, around $50, $55, $58 a barrel. So they're getting oil out of the ground at $55 and they're selling it at $55. So you're getting a zero return on equity. So if you look at the oil and gas industry, and Bloomberg data shows us this, the return on capital over the last 10 years has collapsed. The margins has collapsed. Companies have gone from making margins of 20, 30, 40% down to lower single digits, lower into single digits. And because of that, um, Wall Street has suddenly waken up that this industry that used to be able to get it out of the ground at 10 bucks and sell it at 100 and make huge profits, those days are probably gone now. Um, the fracking and shale oil has actually helped to compete by getting oil out and gas out really cheaply. And the cheap gas has, has killed off virtually the US coal industry and cheap oil is driving out high cost producers around the world and keeping the price of oil low. So um, we know it's only a 2% small imbalance in the demand and supply for oil in the last year saw oil go from 120 bucks down to 20, 25 bucks. Um, and so these huge profits that companies used to make have probably have, have disappeared. Now if electric vehicles come in and kill off demand, as we think will happen, then prices for oil will stay low and with low prices, companies aren't making money. And so that tells us, actually, this is an industry that's facing a crisis. And Wall Street, bank, the banking community, the pension funds around the world are waking up to this. So what I'm saying is, is isn't just a climate problem, though it's that as well. It's actually an existential problem faced really by the cost pressures on the company and the collapse on the return on equity. And investors, investors want to invest a buck and make two bucks. They don't want to invest a buck and make five cents. It's just basic economics. The biggest worry that pension funds and asset managers have is mispricing the risk. They're worried about transition. To move from high carbon to low carbon over a couple of decades requires a fundamental shift in the whole energy system around the world. 
Um, and the transition risks are, are, are going to be pretty challenging. If we, if we leave this to the last minute and carry on with business as usual, there will be a chaotic, disorderly transition. But if we get ready now and start that transition now and start investing in clean energy sources now, then probably that, that transition will be a lot smoother and pension funds will avoid the worst, the worst of the risks and the worst of the volatility. Um, and that's our message really for investors is get prepared now. So what companies should be doing, and this is what we saw from Mayor Bloomberg's and Governor Mark Carney's climate task force set up by the Financial Stability Board, which is a, a project of the G20, is that companies should start to disclose to their shareholders and to the SEC and to the regulatory uh, requirements um, the risks associated with that energy transition. So put it to Exxon, tell us what happens where you're going to have to get 20, 25% smaller. What does that mean for your business? What does this mean for shareholders? So that's the first risk that can be uh, evaluated. And that's how Wall Street can get its arms around uh, ev evaluating that, you know, the challenge of the transition. Now what the, what the divestment movement has been doing has been something quite remarkable. It's forced all the little small ma and pa, 4-1, the retirement type accounts to start asking the pension fund managers, do you understand those risks? It's causing the students that are part of a, go to a university that has an endowment, why are you invested in fossil fuels? And what it's done is around the world it's rattled some cages, it's forced the big firms like UBS and Merrill Lynch and BlackRock to start to evaluate the energy transition risks. And the divestment movement has had a very, very powerful influence on forcing firms that have been really quite reluctant to think about climate as a material issue to start really properly uh, appraising the risks. So we think the divestment movement has played a really important role of, of awareness raising. And just three years ago, I went to the launch here in New York uh, with the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, with members of the Rockefeller family, to say that $50 billion of endowment money and pension fund money and foundation money had divested from fossil fuels. And just in December, I went to the same, just three years later, I went to the same report launch, this time in London, and the figure had grown to $5.3 trillion of institutions that committed to divest from coal, oil and gas, or one or all of the three. And uh, I was with somebody yesterday who thinks the figure is going to grow to $10 trillion. Now this is an uh, unstoppable force because it's based around common sense. You cannot burn all the coal or the oil or the gas, it has to stay in the ground. Why isn't Wall Street woken up to this challenge? and why? Why deploy more capital into trying to expand a sector which ultimately has to wind itself down? Not overnight, but over the next couple of decades and in a planned and carefully considered way that protects wealth and protects jobs. Yeah, well, I mean, there is a view that ESG or sustainable investing would be mainstreamed and I'd like to see a world in which all investors took into account climate risk or any other kinds of risks in the environment or society but I think it doesn't really recognize a basic problem or challenge which is uh, the goal of business is to make profits and if that means paying people uh, five bucks an hour or ten bucks an hour instead of fifty bucks an hour then companies will pay people ten bucks an hour if the chief exec thinks he's worth $200 million and uh, wants to pay himself that money and the workers, he only wants to pay him 20,000 bucks, then there's no really a system to hold them to account to change that. So it's another way of saying that the interests of, of businessmen and women and the interests of their shareholders are not necessarily the same as the interests of, of the environment uh, or, or employees. And there's a constant tension. So how do we get rid of that constant tension? And I'm not sure of that. ESG or sustainability can remove that conflict completely. I like to see probably I like to see management sit down with their workforce and talk about paying conditions and, and, and health benefits and a living wage. But we're not really seeing that. So I think it'll, these issues will only have been mainstreamed when instead of treating the atmosphere as a dumping ground for greenhouse gases where you don't pay for them or the seas as a place to exploit with unsustainable fishing where you you know, harvest unsustainably the oceans, um, the resources of the oceans, that we think of um, the environment and society more holistically. And that requires some really tough choices. And I'm not sure really that the debate, the discussion has got there yet about, not about the, the ideal where we should be, but about the real conflicts and how we resolve those conflicts and how we bring people together.
Um, and I think the impact sustainable investing world uh, hasn't quite understood really where those battlegrounds lie. Now, if you come to an ESG impact investing event, there's a couple of communities that are never really there. Um, the one community is, is organized labor is never really there. And, and staff and workforce and employees, their voice is never really heard. And too often we kind of forget about the, that important community.